You guessed it, folks. It's time for another gracious guest show. And I'm your host, Mike Creevy, host and guest in that I am the host of this particular podcast. But the whole point of this podcast and, and really this whole effort on my website over there at thegraciousguest.org is to get us all thinking a little bit more about the value of, of being a guest in this life, a guest in this world, to uh, treat our sort of experience in this world as uh, as guests, basically. Not so much uh, rulers or dictators or, um, you know, any anything that would lead us into a lifestyle where we take more than we give. Uh, and that's, that's something that I think is really important. And I hopefully, you know, uh, you would agree that the world would be a better place if we were all a little uh, more gracious guests in it, right? So, uh, so to that end on this program, if this is your first time tuning in, what I like to do is a lot of different things to explore wonder and awe to encourage us all, myself first and foremost, you know, because I'm not so much here giving you life lessons from my cloud, as they say on uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia quite a bit, but rather to encourage uh, all of us to be intentional, be deliberate about pressing pause during our days, uh, even in the littlest ways to try to open up, to be receptive to receiving um, uh, an experience of wonder and awe. Uh, if you want to get technical with it, i got to look up the, the reference on this. But I think this goes back to at least ancient Greek philosophy. I want to say it was Socrates, this idea of dilatatio or dilation, you know, that you go through this process of being first humble, you know, being uh, down to earth. That doesn't mean you don't dream or you don't have, a, you know, um, a, a spiritual side, you know, that you're just totally pragmatic or something like that. You're humble in that you admit the truth, the truth of yourself, the truth of yourself in relation to uh, the world around you, others around you, God, the divine, you know, however you understand that, that your first point is to recognize that you are not God. Okay? Newsflash. If you're listening to this, uh, you are not God. Uh, God hears, I believe, everything. And I'm sure he hears all my podcasts. But, you know, if you're tuning into this and you're a human being, uh, you are not God. Step two. Um to then with that, step back and and choose. And it's hard. You know, sometimes we, we forget to do this a lot. But to choose to uh, ask, to, to be receptive, to recognize that there's something, just in a very general way, guys, there's something outside of you that has something to say about you. <laughs> you know, and I'm not talking about like peer pressure and all that kind of thing or, you know, the, the, the bad things or the things that make us break down and, and not have any confidence. None of that. No, the, the, the good um, from which we all spring. Um, so that's kind of what this is all about. The idea that there's, you know, far from highfalutin philosophy and stuff, this is very practical because this has to do with everyday life. So what do I do on this show? I attempt to uh, explore things that can give us a little glimmer of that. So again, I'm not some huge subject matter expert, but I think I'm somebody who, you know, at least somewhat regularly has, has made a decision in life to uh, to be uh, open to possibilities, to be open to the great, the wonderful, the beautiful, the true, um, and to and to be open to seeing those things in places that a lot of times we might you know think they won't show up or overlook them. So books, movies, video games. I should do one on those maybe sometime. I don't know. I'm not a big gamer anymore, but uh, uh, you know, food, travel. Different human experiences, different things I've been through that I can share with you, you know, just where I've encountered wonder um, and awe and, and uh, something that has made me think that, you know, hey, you know, there's something going on behind the veil here, <laughs> you know. So at any rate, that's what The Gracious Guest is all about. So thanks for tuning in. And uh, so that's a little intro. And if you want to, um, if you haven't subscribed to um, my YouTube channel, you can check that out. Uh, I've got some videos up there. I'm putting a few up per week usually now. Podcasts, uh, you subscribe on iTunes. You can check it out on Podbean, Pod, uh, Pocket Casts, different um, ways of accessing it. I think Google Play Music also, you could, uh, you could find the podcast as well. And please do me a favor, spread the word. I'm really trying to get the word out about this because nothing helps this show and all of the stuff I'm trying to do on my website to grow and to kind of reach more people and to generate conversation 
than word of mouth, and that really means a lot. So, uh, so thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get right to it. This show, uh, as you see, I called it Flannery O'Connor and Church Scandal. Flannery O'Connor and Church Scandal. Okay, well, what's that all about? So, uh, if you're not aware, Flannery O'Connor was a, uh, a novelist, a short story writer, who lived in the first half of, of the 20th century. I don't have her birth date in front of me here, um, but uh, I want to say, well, 1920s or 30s, so you know, forgive me on that. I want to say the 1930s. So, in the early, late 40s, early 50s, uh, she is um, she's growing up. She's from Georgia. She's you know, grown up in that sort of uh, segregated Southern sort of experience. And uh, actually, pause one second. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to search this because this is going to drive me nuts. I'm going to ask Google. When was Flannery O'Connor born? 1925. Wow, Google's pretty cool. And then we'll try another one here real quick. When did Flannery O'Connor die? 1964. Okay, so I knew she, yeah, she was in her late 30s when she passed away, but I couldn't remember when she had died. So she was born on uh, March 25th, uh, 19, whoops, no, oh, I just had it there, <laughs> 1925, right, is that what I said? <laughs> yeah, 1925. Uh, so, yeah, so in the mid-40s mid then, um, she sort of emerges as a, um, as a great writer, you know, um, as a great uh, writer of f fiction, primarily. And she writes all these short stories, and then, you know, in the 50s, she really kind of gains a little more uh, prominence, and then she dies early in 1964. She had a, a series of, of uh, illnesses and and um, what was um, uh, kind of an invalid in a lot of ways, and she lived the last few years of her life on her sort of her family property um, in, in Georgia. And she had peacocks, and, you know, you see them show up in a lot of her stories. And there's a lot of common themes that show up in Flannery O'Connor's stories. And I'm by no means, guys, an expert... I'd been told for years, oh, you have to read Flannery O'Connor. Got to read Flannery O'Connor. So I'm finally getting around to it now um, after a long time. And I must say, as I started reading her stories, I was super depressed because they're, <laughs> they're filled with, with racism and sadness and death and misery. And, you know, like it, it's pretty dark. So just be aware of that ahead of time. There is a reason for all that. I'm going to get to a little bit in a second um, just by talking about this one story. But, uh, but but again, you know, so you see pictures of her and she's a sort of like mousy looking like southern lady, like, you know, like a 50s era kind of blouse and like these kind of cat eye glasses and pearls and her hair's all done up. You know, like she just looks like any picture of, you know, if you're my age and, you know, a grandparent or a great aunt or somebody dies and you see a picture of them from, like, when they were in high school or, or when they were in their 20s, pretty much just looks like anyone, like, in my grandmother's yearbook. You know what I mean? Like, she just looks like that. So then you start reading her stories, and again, all those things, it's like, whoa, okay, um, this is pretty dark stuff. And there's, like, you know, sexual deviance and, and you know, like, it's just... But it's... Let me just clarify. It's not... Um, it's it's clearly not like those themes, even though they're there, they're not stuffed in your face the way they are a lot of times today, or they're not certainly not glorified. They are always, uh, as I'm reading her more and more and more here, um, there there's always something else going on behind the scenes, and that's the whole point. And that's why I think she's such a great author for for uh, my consideration and yours, in that um, there is a, a deeper takeaway. You know, there's something, and she and she doesn't like beat you over the head with it, but she sort of plants the seed, and then you kind of like it grows, and like after you've read the story, and you keep thinking about it, and it, it may connect in a lot of ways you didn't expect. And just to give you an example of this, uh, and spoiler alert, I'm just going to kind of ruin the plot of this particular short story. This is, um, I recommend you get this from, um, let me get the publisher here. Um, wow, Farrar, F A R R A R, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, New York. Um, you can find this on um, Amazon or anything. It's it's a one volume called The Complete Stories, Flannery O'Connor, and it's it's got all of her short stories. So this particular volume I found in a bookshop, um, really awesome. It was published in, let's see here, I don't see right here when this particular volume came out, but it's relatively new. It's only a few years old, and it's it's like a white um, a white uh, cover with a peacock on it and everything. Um, and I'll put this in the show notes so you can access it later. But it's it's all of her short stories, and they're arranged in chronological order, as I understand it. And the introduction was very helpful in laying all this out and kind of setting you up for it. 
But this particular story I want to talk about is called Good Country People. It was first published in Harper's Bazaar, Volume 89, in uh, June of 1955. And it's also the, uh, the ninth story in a collection, a famous collection for short stories called A Good Man is Hard to Find. That story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, of that title is, is a very sort of shocking story as well. And it's one of her more famous ones, as I understand it. But this story, Good Country People, uh, I just want to focus on this for a second. It's, you know, to set this up, essentially you have this lady, uh, Mrs. Freeman, and uh, she, um, you know, she keeps, it keeps coming back, this this refrain throughout the story that... Uh, that good, you know, good country people are hard to find. <laughs> you know, kind of riffing off that title, a good man is hard to find. And Mrs. Mrs. Freeman, th uh, throughout the story, uh, it pops up in a few different places where she just kind of laments that, you know, like, oh, you know, if we could only have good country people, you know, like basically the world's going to hell in a handbasket, and we just need some more good country people, you know. And there's this this kind of again refrain that keeps popping up, and we're we're introduced pretty early on to uh, her daughter, her daughter Joy. And her daughter, Joy, has lost her leg, um, or at least a portion of her leg, when she was a child from, from a um, kind of a hunting accident. There was this freak accident where her leg got shot off. Um, and then what happens is, as you can imagine, you know, she grows up and, and faces a lot of struggles and challenges because of that. And, and we're sort of led to believe, you get the impression that, that through years of just suffering, as you can imagine, that would produce, Joy, you know... And her, I don't think she's named that by mistake. Joy be becomes the antithesis of joy. That joy finds a lot of trouble finding joy in life. And she becomes very inward focused and she sort of um, doesn't find herself attractive and she loses confidence. And then she sort of retreats, really, in a way, into this this pursuit of, of a kind of a hostile, nitpicky, um, almost like an envy. And if you know anything about Catholic teaching about the, the capital sins, as they're called, you know, the seven primary really bad sins that then branch into others, envy is more than just jealousy. You know, if I'm jealous of you, like if you get, if you get a new car and I want a new car, I'm jealous. You know, I, I want something that you have and I want that for myself, right? Envy is worse than jealousy because envy is... I don't want you to have anything good. Like, I want you to be just as miserable as I am. There's no even positive thing to pin it on. You know, the, the, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real depraved, very twisted, very, very dangerous kind of sin. Because it's the kind of sin where, you know, if you look at it from the standpoint of, of modern cinema, if you guys know the movie The Dark Knight with Heath Ledger's Joker, uh, there's that famous line when Batman's trying to figure out, you know, Bruce Wayne's trying to figure out how to um, how to get to the Joker? Like, what's the Joker want? You know, we got to figure out what he wants. And uh, there's that chilling scene where Alfred tells him this story about when he was a young man and they were chasing this bandit, you know, in Southeast Asia who was a diamond thief, but then they or a jewel thief, and they found out that he was actually just throwing the jewels away in the in the jungle. And Bruce Wayne says to him, he goes, well, then why steal them? He goes, well, because it was good sport, you know, because you know, whatever. Like, there's not really a legitimate reason. He said, some men can't be bargained with. You know, some men can't be reasoned with. He goes, some men just want to watch the world burn. That's a really chilling, terrifying prospect, right? And that's the really the heart of the devil's sin in, in Catholic theology is not so much that, like, the devil wants to have us and make this army and then we're, like, you know, like on a sort of a parallel track to heaven. It's just the bad one. No, it's it's emptiness and despair and, like, he wants just everyone and everything to share in his misery and loneliness and sorrow and have nothing. So, uh, Joy kind of falls into some of that, you know, and, and not as drastic maybe as all that, but we see, you know, she drives her mom crazy. Mrs. Mrs. Um, uh, Freeman is, is stressed out all the time by her, and, and you know, she's... Uh, Joy uh, goes to college and she changes her name to Hulga because it's ugly. Like, it's, it's like she wants to just drive it home. You know, like, I will not be happy. I will not be Joy, you know. Um, and she becomes an atheist and, and she knows that bothers her mom. And it's just this constant, like, just deliberately being antagonistic. But at the heart of it, you can kind of feel for her a little bit because you kind of get the sense that deep down there's there's... There's a real pain, a real sorrow there, but but she's she sort of finds her confidence. She finds this kind of veiled. She sort of 
she sort of masks her lack of confidence and her fear and her, her feelings of detachment and all that kind of stuff. Uh, her inability to really trust or to feel beautiful, all those kinds of things. She veils it, you know, in a lot of outward demonstrations of, of pushiness and showiness and cockiness and confidence. She gets a PhD in philosophy, you know, and um, uh, I'm trying to find the, the, the line here. Yeah, here you go. The girl had taken the P. This is from page 276. The girl had taken the PhD in philosophy, and this left Mrs. Hopewell at a complete loss. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I got the names wrong. Mrs. Freeman is the lady that helps Mrs. Hopewell. Mrs. Hopewell is, is her mom. So Mrs. Hopewell says here, um, left Mrs. Hopewell at a complete loss. You could say, my daughter is a, is a nurse, or my daughter is a school teacher, or even my daughter is a chemical engineer. You could not say, my daughter is a philosopher. That was something that had ended with the Greeks and Romans. So anyways, um, yeah, and here you go. All day, Joy sat on her neck in a deep chair reading. Sometimes she went for walks, but she didn't like dogs or cats or birds or flowers or nature or nice young men. She looked at nice young men as if she could smell their stupidity. <laughs> so she's just this miserable character, and she names herself Hulga deliberately because it's ugly. Well, long story short, we, we see uh, this young man enters the scene, and uh, he's a Bible salesman. So he shows up, and I'm just, I'm trying to remember his name here. Let me look here. Um, oh, he didn't, yeah, he introduces himself later on. So yeah, he introduces, or he, yeah, I'm sorry, he shows up and, and he comes in. He's a Bible salesman. He's a young guy. He's like 19 years old. And, um, you know, he, he is, is really quite the salesman. You know, he's really slick. <laughs> and he, he wants to sell Mrs. Uh, Hopewell these, uh, these Bibles. And, uh, you know, he shows up and he tries his pitch and, and Mrs. Hopewell's not really interested. And, and it makes mention that she's, you know, they have a Bible, but it's upstairs in the attic because because Joy slash Holga won't let her get it out. She's always on her case about that. So the boy stays for dinner and he's like real smooth and he's, he's you know, um, really just kind of uh, seems the part, you know. And uh, um Jo he basically, uh, Mrs. Hopewell's nervous about him meeting her daughter because her daughter's this raving atheist and all this kind of thing. So uh, at the end of the night, you know, he, he, he doesn't sell any Bibles, but, you know, he, she, she says he can come back, you know, to dinner. And, you know, he's a good country boy, right? You know, he's, thank God, here's a good country boy. And um, to make a long story short, he goes out and he, they see him uh, talking to Holga, to Joy. Like, she walks into the gate. And, you know, Mrs. Hopewell and some other people in the house are confused, like, oh, my gosh, what are they talking about? Well, as we find out, uh, they actually kind of hit it off a little bit, and Holga gets it in her mind. I'll just call her Joy. Uh, she gets it in her mind to seduce him. Like, to her, it becomes this plan. Like, she imagines getting him to the barn and basically, you know, like, seducing him and having sex with him. And then, uh, you know, she'll sort of, in a sense, achieve this, this new level of, like, winning over, you know, and controlling things, right? Well... She actually finds herself, like, they, they meet up, and they get to the barn, and, and things start kind of going in that direction, but she actually starts kind of responding to him in a way she didn't expect to. And I'm not going to get, it doesn't get super graphic here, okay, so don't worry. Um, but they, they get up in the, the loft, and she's kind of all cocky, and they're, they're kind of making out and all this kind of stuff. And then he keeps wanting to see her leg, and he seems to express this interest. And there's this amazing scene where basically what transpires is she finds herself coming to sort of trust him and be willing to be vulnerable a little bit with him and lets him take her leg off, you know, where it connects. And she's, she's sort of, you know, got this, this vulnerable moment that she didn't expect to have. Like she thought she was in the driver's seat and then lo and behold, the boy <laughs> turns out to not be quite the country boy that they thought, you know, he gets out, he has a flask and he's got some alcohol. And then it turns out that the Bible's are hollowed out and inside them are, are, he's got, you know, condoms and he's got, you know, like other stuff, you know, that it just, it's like this big twist and you're like, whoa. And he turns out to be quite the devious little hypocrite. He, and, and she's like shocked and upset. And it turns out that he's been using her this whole time, that this was never, like, he doesn't believe a word. And like, he knows the Bible back and front, but he doesn't believe any of it. He's a complete hypocrite. And then he steals her leg and he runs away and leaves her in the loft of the barn. <laughs> you know. And then meanwhile, her mom's like, oh, I wonder what ever happened to that good country boy. So you got to read this story. Again, good country people. Flannery O'Connor. 
And, you know, I, I won't belabor this, but just I wanted to I want to close with just a little connection here. Two things that, that really jumped out at me after reading this story is number one, a hypocrite. People love to throw that word around. A hypocrite is not someone who is, well, for example, like me. <laughs> I'll use myself as an example. Just to be honest, I am not a hypocrite because I teach all about the Catholic faith and I'm a believer and I, I teach all these these things about Jesus, but then struggle with them myself a lot of times. So, you know, like I would teach my students in high school about lying being bad. It's evil. It's a sin. Do I lie? Yes, I do. All right. Do I like that? No, I don't. So I'm, I'm not a hypocrite. A hypocrite is not someone who's, who struggles and tries to do the right thing and really you know, teaches the right thing and then really struggles, even gets it wrong maybe most of the time or, or, or has a real hard time living out the right thing. That's not a hypocrite. That is just not what the word means. The word hypocrite comes from a Greek word that was used for the mask that an actor wore on the stage. Hypocrite, literally, and please understand this. Please try to, in your own setting, get people to use this correctly because it's doing a lot of damage out there. Cardinal McCarrick, okay, let's get serious. Archbishop McCarrick was and is, I would argue, a hypocrite, okay? Judas was a hypocrite, you know, in the end. You know, you could say, so in general, a hypocrite is someone who says one thing but doesn't actually believe it. You know, you basically, you're, you're not buying what you're selling, in a sense. You put on a show, but it's all just an act. And at the end of the day, you don't believe a word of it. And you're just using it for your own advantage, and in this story, the boy is a great example. Helga is not a hypocrite, okay, at all. Joy is not a hypocrite. But um, who is a hypocrite is, um, is the boy, this Bible salesman. He is a hypocrite. He's a hypocrite. He's pretending to actually uh, stand up for all these things and to actually be a Bible sales. And he's selling Bibles, but he's going around. But it's all make-believe. It's all show. So... Flannery O'Connor and church scandal. I would simply just say that one thing that can be a great takeaway, this is the second thing really kind of related, is that when we look at scandal in the church, for example, or scandal for anywhere for that matter, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that it happens, you know. Um, we make the mistake of thinking that everyone who, who talks the talk is, is right on and doing the right thing. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're actually a hypocrite. Sometimes they're a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know. So how do you know who to trust? Well, sometimes it's really hard to know who to trust. And at the end of the day, that's where I think prayer really comes in. Prayer, doing the right thing, and, uh, and trying, to, uh, trying to stand up for what you know is right. And even if it's really hard to do that, especially if it's really hard to do that. So, hopefully... Uh, you'll go right out and get Flannery O'Connor's short stories. You'll be able to, um, you know, dig into her stories and really, you know, re-read them, re-read them, see what, what connects. You know, there's a lot of things that are relevant for us today, I think, in our society. A lot of takeaways that can be really, really significant. And uh, when push comes to shove, you know, I think we all need to, um, you know, uh, be intentional and try to find, because it's out there, try to find stuff to read. Try to w watch good movies. Watch you know, TV shows, like find stuff that actually encourages you to go deeper, to think about wonder, to think about, um, you know, um, to think about those things that uh, we can actually connect to our real lives and uh, that can really help us to hopefully, you know, assess things around us and, and to, to, to be uh, better people, you know, to, to grow in uh, understanding and appreciate, appreciation for, I should say, and continue to grow in understanding of the reality that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than meets the eye. So that's all I've got today for The Gracious Guest Show. I'm Mike Creevy. I'm your host. Please check out the website, thegraciousguest.org. The Gracious Guest Podcast is on iTunes, on Google Play Music, on Podbean, on uh, Pocket Casts, various other podcast uh, platforms. You can go check it out. Spread the word. Check out the YouTube page as well. Just look me up at The Gracious Guest. you find my little logo over there. It's a white background, purple, TGG. Uh, and uh, feel free to subscribe. I'm trying to get the subscription uh, number, uh, that subscription number up on YouTube as well. So take care, and until next time, don't forget to wonder.